Good morning, everybody. Today's video is sponsored by YubiKey, everybody's best friend. Before we get into the nerdy stuff, let me just start off by saying that this little baby is used absolutely everywhere. And I have worked everywhere. Amazon, Facebook, on my bed, underneath my bed, at Google, parking lot. It counts. Oh yes, it counts. I'm telling you, they are everywhere and everybody is using it. That's a marker that you should be using it too. YubiKeys. If everybody is doing it, so should you. You can tell your mom I said that. You should also get your mom one. Anyway, in one word, YubiKeys are a highly secure and very simple device uh, to authenticate yourself via one tap. So instead of getting a verification code via SMS, subjecting you to man in the middle attacks, you could just tap your YubiKey right here or just tap it on your phone via NFC and yeah, then you're authenticated. Now the question is, what is wrong with USB-C ports on my phone? Oh God, USB-C ports, what am I doing? Anyway, the question is, what is wrong with two-factor authentication with my phone? Well, SIM swapping for one. SIM swapping can happen when someone calls into AT&T pretending to be you. They take your SIM card, have your phone number, steal your wife, your dog, and now they can bypass two-factor authentication and pet your dog and maybe do stuff with your wife. I don't know what, but stuff they will do. Picnics. I don't know. Anyway, that is SIM swapping. Another point of failure for two-factor authentication is phishing. Phishing is essentially emails and calls that send you to very official looking websites for you to input your username and password into and now they have access to your account. It's horrific. So something like, oh, I want to sign in to pets.com, but it actually sends you to pets.com. You don't want to get that wrong. And they've gotten really, really good these days. My mom got an official looking Apple email receipt that said she, that, that she bought like bubble, bubble man. And she thought it was me, okay? I won't play bubble man. That actually sounds pretty fun. I might buy it, I might buy it later. Anyway, my mom thought it was me. She sent me a message and I said, nope, do not click on that link. Woman, mom, miss, ma'am, don't give your credit card details away. Don't give your bank account details. Don't give my inheritance away. I need it. I need it to buy Flappy Bird, the only game worth paying 99 cents for. Inclusion two-factor authentication via your phone isn't good enough. Now you might ask, what about password managers? Password managers are amazing. You should be using it in conjunction with YubiKeys. But here's the thing, a YubiKey can protect you more than a strong password can ever. Oh, I bet your password is in the dark web. I bet you it's not even in the depths of the dark web. It's in the kiddie pool of the dark web, isn't it? Password one, two, three, Paris Hilton. Oh, I wonder how many people I caught. Ugh. My grandma's password I know too. It's her favorite grandchild's name. My sister, it hurts. It hurts so bad. Anyway, password managers are great because they allow you to generate random strong passwords for every single service. So Facebook, GitHub, whatever you use. If it gets stolen by a man in the middle attack or phishing and you somehow just don't realize it, that's it. So unlike password managers, U2F, which is what YubiKey uses along with a bunch of other things, but we'll be focusing on UTF for this video. Uh, it actually verifies you for every single password attempt. I'll be explaining this process over and over again with increasing degrees of complexity, but the TLDR is that U2F issues you a challenge and the challenge is, a, is as follows. And sorry, let me just say that U2F is actually what YubiKey uses amongst other things, but for the purpose of this video, we'll be focusing on U2F. The challenge is as follows. Pets.com says, here is a random string that changes every time you sign in. Sign in and encrypt it with your private key. YubiKey says, okay, done. 
Pets.com says, let me decrypt it with the public key you initially gave me when you first signed up. Now let's check if this decrypted string is the same as the original string. If it is, then you may pass. And that's it. Let's dive into the technical details of how this works. But first, let's explain a similar thing, but explain like you were five. And let's go through the sign up and the sign in process. So the sign up process for the explain like I'm five version is as follows. You install a fancy lock that you could just put a code in. The key never ever has to interact with the lock itself. Instead, they interact via secret passwords. The key has the power to encrypt messages and of course has the power to decrypt messages. So the key gives the lock a cipher to be able to decrypt any messages that the key ends up encrypting. No other lock has a cipher but this one. The sign-in process but the explain like M5 version will be as follows. You go up the doorstep with your key. The lock says if you are really who you say you are, encrypt ABC in a way that I myself could decrypt it with a cipher that you gave me when you originally signed up. The key says, okay, let me encrypt ABC. It becomes W-O-W and it sends it back to the lock. The lock then decrypts W-O-W with a cipher that the key originally gave it when you first signed up again and it gives back ABC. The decrypted version of W-O-W is ABC. Now the lock confirms that it's really you. In order for a hacker to come in, they would have to know how your key encrypts those messages and also the cipher of the lock. But remember, you never had to stick your key in the lock hole, so it can't really be stolen in that way. So really, your encryption keys can only get stolen if someone physically takes that key. To add an additional layer of security, the only way your key can encrypt it the right way is if it confirms that the address that you originally signed up with and synced up with with the lock is actually the same. If not, it doesn't encrypt the message correctly. Now that we got that out of the way, let's talk about it with more technical terminology. During the signup process, YubiKey generates a private public key pair for the service that you're currently signing up with. You then send over the public key, which the service then stores, and then you store the service and the private key as a, as a, as a key value store. During the sign-in process, the service itself sends a challenge in the form of a random string. It hits a browser layer, which verifies the domain it's coming from, and then finally sends it over to the YubiKey. The YubiKey will look up the correct domain in its key value store and take the private key and then sign the challenge and sends it back to the browser layer, then back to the service. The service will then use the public key it has, decrypt the signed challenge, and if it matches the original string, then you may pass. The browser layer is quite important here because this is how YubiKey actually protects you from phishing. If for some reason the challenge is not immediately from pets.com but is actually pets.com, the YubiKey will encrypt it in a different way because it doesn't just take into account the private key, it actually takes into account the private key and the domain. So when it signs the challenge with the domain and the private key, then it will be useless for the fisher. If it was just two-factor authentication via SMS, what could happen was that it could just intercept the verification code that you typed in and then use it to log into pets.com. This implementation doesn't fully encapsulate how YubiKey works because we mentioned the key value store, so what would happen if the service is not actually in that key value store? We could actually go a technical level deeper and feel free to skip to the end because you know, YubiKeys can get, U2F can get quite complicated and maybe the details of it don't really matter to you, but yeah, I mean, if you if you want to nerd out a little bit, we could go over it. Anyway, this isn't necessary again, but I wanted to go over it anyway. You might be wondering a key value store for the same reasons I just mentioned, but also you're probably wondering, doesn't that give the YubiKey a finite amount of services that it can sign up with? So now you're going to be asking, well, how many services could I actually sign up with this thing? Well, fear not. Engineering has solved this issue. Within YubiKey, there must have been a technical, hardware, and economical challenge with these keys. Within YubiKey, there must have been a PM that asked, how do we save more money? For the consumer, of course. But still retain the same level of security. Well, what if instead of storing the private keys on the device, we saw it in the service instead. I know that sounds crazy and it feels like it defeats the entire purpose of, of creating these YubiKeys, but 
Hear me out. So what does YubiKey do? It does what it knows how to do best, which is encrypt it. So during the sign up process, it'll do the exact same process as a while ago, but where it differs is that instead of storing the service private key pair in the device, instead what it will do is it encrypts the private key with what is called the main key of the YubiKey plus the domain and then sends it over to the service itself. This removes the need to store anything on the device but the main key itself. This is genius. And again, having the domain as part of the encryption process along with the private key is important here uh, because it means the attacker with a different domain will not be able to just, uh, will not be part of this, this encrypted key. Therefore, it cannot decrypt it. Now during sign-in, it's a little bit different because now when you make a request, the service actually itself has to send over that encrypted private key um, to the browser level and back to you. Then you decrypt it with a main key and the, the app ID or the, the domain. And then now you have a private key that you could actually sign challenges with and now you could continue on the process. And that's it. All in all, U2F can get quite complicated and implementations might vary, but needless to say, when you have one of these things, you'll be protected. I totally didn't show it. Get one. I have a main key. So I have one in my personal MacBook. I have one in my work MacBook. I have a backup one just in case this fails on my MacBook. And I also have an NFC one. You should get one. Get everybody one. Anyway, I hope this was helpful and I'll see you guys soon. Bye.